So today I'll be talking about the planning of all stages, including the sale of business. And let's we'll be talking about reti uh, retirement and sale. So first, uh, we're going to look at the different stages of a business. Then we're going to talk about why should you be ready to sell, and how do you get ready to sell or retire. So the different stages, we generally see four stages in any business. The first one is when you're starting up new. The second one is when your business is starting to grow. Uh, third phase is when you've got mature growth. And then the fourth stage is when you're getting ready to retire or sell. So when you're starting up, at this point, you still need all your money to fund your personal expenses. And you're not ready to leave any of the excess cash in the business. You may want to incorporate at this stage, but there's no real tax benefit um, at this stage to incorporate. If you do want to incorporate, please come and talk to us so we can make sure that you get set up properly to make sure that any future planning is easier. So the second stage that we see is growing your business. And um, the second phase is where the business has been running for a couple of years and it keeps on growing. So this is a good phase to be in. You're making more money than you need for your personal expenses. So you're starting to leave some money in the business. And um, therefore, the company is starting to use the small business rate. And that is currently at 13.5% on the first 500,000 that is taxed in the company. You start looking at um, paying your spouse as well as different ways to um, pay money to yourself and your spouse. And then we start looking at the different ways of paying. So generally it's salary versus dividend. And with salaries, you always have to remember when you're paying a salary to yourself, uh, to yourself, uh, not yourself, your spouse, um, if she's not a shareholder, it has to be reasonable. It has to be for services rendered, and it has to be documented in order to make sure that it's deductible. Um, dividends, on the other hand, doesn't have to be reasonable. So that's always a good way of looking at it. At this stage, you can consider adding shareholders, especially your spouse, because then you, you don't have the same problems with this always having to be reasonable. But we need to ensure that there is a be a no benefit transfer to any new shareholders. Therefore, we will need to determine the value of the company and do a proper freeze of the value in order to bring in new shareholders at a nominal price. So what is a freeze? A freeze is when you transfer the value of a company that is currently held in the common shares at a specific time to the preferred shares, and thereby freezing the value of, uh, of the company in the preferred shares. We generally exchange the common shares for preferred shares at this stage. Therefore, the common shares have a nominal value after the freeze, and new shareholders can uh, subscribe for common shares at a nominal price without uh, um, conferring any benefit to the new shareholders. The goal for a freeze is to have the future growth in the common shares and in the hands of the new shareholders. So when we get to the mature growth, that is a couple years after you start uh, really growing. The business has been doing very well, and it is nicely established at this time. You have been leaving the excess, excess cash in the business to make further investments in the business to help the business grow even more. Your family has grown as well. Your kids are living, uh, leaving the house and going to university or traveling or starting their lives outside the house and they need more money. So this is where we find a lot of our clients at at the moment. Therefore, there is a need to start looking at your options of having the money taxed in your children's hands um, instead of you getting taxed and then you have to give them after tax money. Uh, the same as what we talked about with your spouse, you have the option of paying your children's salaries, but the same thing again, you have to make sure that it's reasonable for services rendered and make sure that you document everything. Or if there are shareholders, you can pay them dividends. At this stage, you also start thinking about retiring. It's not something, oops, sorry. It's not something that you think about sort of in the next couple of years, but since you know that you have to start planning well ahead of um, actually retiring, we're talking usually about about five years before you think about retiring or selling, you actually start getting ready. Oh my word, it keeps on going. Um, sorry. Um, so you, you're starting to think 
now maybe I should set up my company right at this point in time. So three of the most common ways that we see people setting up their comp uh, uh, getting ready for retirement are introducing a family trust, um, restructuring the company to add dividend sprinkling shares to the kids, or adding a hold co sister company. Okay, so what are the benefits of a family trust? First of all, a family trust is a separate legal entity. And due to the discretionary nature of the trust, creditors of the children, including estranged spouses, may be precluded from successfully pursuing assets of the trust to satisfy any claims against the beneficiaries. There has been some changes to the estate and trust legislation in BC. So if this is one of the main things that you're worried about and why you're setting up a trust, you should probably talk to a lawyer to ensure that this is the right vehicle for you. The second benefit is that a trust is discretionary. And in my opinion, this is probably one of the biggest benefits that you're gonna have um, using a family trust. You don't need to decide at the start of the trust how to distribute the trust assets or income to the beneficiaries. By virtue of the ver uh, discretionary nature of the trust, both you and your spouse can be appointed as trustees, uh, sorry, as trustees, and can therefore defer any decision made on the distribution of the assets in the trust for as long as you want, or at least 21 years due to a 21 year rule. Alternatively, you can have a trustee um, could make distributions to one or more, or you can really decide who you want to make any dis um, distributions to. And you retain a measure of control over the assets held by the trust, um, by you or your spouse acting as trustees. And one of the other big benefits is that you can, you've got the benefit of multiplying your capital gains exemption um, between all of the beneficiaries on an arm's length sale. Uh, the third big benefit is that a trust is confidential. Unlike probate wills, which are public documents, there is no public disclosure requirement for trust assets. So that is something when we start getting into a joint partner trust or alter ego trust that is really a big thing. So what are the disadvantages? The biggest thing is that you're gonna need a valuation done in the business in order to do a proper freeze of the value of the company at the time that you want to introduce the trust as a shareholder. The reason for that is you wanna make sure that the trust can subscribe for shares at a nominal value, because generally the trust doesn't have any assets before you, uh, when you start it. And you wanna make sure that you're not conferring a benefit to any of the shareholders. The other big um, disadvantage is that you've got ongoing legal and accounting fees on the setup of a trust. So dividend shares. Um, what are the benefits of setting up or restructuring your company to add dividend shares? Uh, one of the biggest benefits are that arguably there's no value to any of these um, shares. And therefore, you don't have to worry about estranged spouses of your children um, if they are shareholders of these shares because the shares are worth nothing. But they do have the option of paying dividends um, to your children. So you can um, pay dividends to some of them uh, depending on how the, the classes are set up. So, and then the kids will be taxed on them. And there's no ongoing legal or accounting fees if, except for the dividend resolutions, obviously, but there's no uh, corporate fees or anything like that going on. What are some of the disadvantages? The biggest one in my, in my opinion is that these shares don't have a value, and because they don't have a value, you can't split the capital gains exemption between um, the shareholders. And um, there are still some accounting and legal fees on the setup of these ones. So why am I not talking about um, giving your children common shares? The biggest reason is because generally what we've seen is that you don't want to give that, for, uh, that much control to your kids. And most of the owners will actually prefer setting up a trust and having the trust own the shares and thereby getting all of the benefits that you would have by giving them common shares but without the kids actually having control. Setting up a hold co sister co. So the biggest benefit of setting up a hold co is that you can transfer excess cash using tax-free intercorporate dividends. 
This will help keep the company clean so you can use your capital gains exemption, which is something that Les will be talking about soon. And it also helps with credit proofing of the company. So what are the costs? Um, you've got accounting and legal fees, obviously on the freeze of the company to introduce a holding company. And then you've got ongoing legal and accounting fees on the upkeep of the company. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Les and he'll be talking about the retirement or sale of a company. Thank you. Thanks. In general, um, uh, businesses usually, you if you're incorporated, uh, you have a couple of different ways that, that you can actually structure that sale. So for, for many of you who have, have been through that, it, it's, it's probably uh, a bit repetitive. You, you essentially look at whether you can sell the assets of the company or if you can actually sell the shares of it. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, there's usually um, a general preference by the, the vendor to, to sell the shares because it's simpler and and, uh, and you can take advantage of what uh, Annalie had brought up, the capital gains exemption, and I'll kind of give you a bit more detail of that uh, shortly. Um, uh, alternatively, the, the, the purchaser is usually looking to buy the assets because it, it, that way they're, they're usually getting a bump in the tax value of those assets that can lead to Dedu bigger deductions down the road, but uh, more importantly, from a legal or liability standpoint, uh, you're not taking on the liabilities, perhaps, of what that company had by buying its shares. So, you know, from a, a buyer's standpoint or a purchaser's standpoint, they just really want the assets or the business itself as opposed to taking on this corporation that has a history to it. Uh, Obviously, as I mentioned, the capital gains exemption wouldn't be available to uh, a shareholder if they were uh, selling the assets because the, the company is the one that's recognizing the gain as opposed to the individual selling the shares. Um, alternatively, um, if, if you do sell the shares, the, it, it is quite uh, complex, so there's things like alternative minimum tax that need to be uh, kept in mind when, when you do try and take advantage of the capital gains exemption. So what is the capital gains exemption? Really, it's, it's a, a lifetime amount of capital gains that you can shelter that arise from a certain specific type of transaction. So uh, in this case, it's, it's a, a qualified small business corporation's shares. Uh, there's also situations if you held a farm corporation that that too would be eligible for it. But in most cases with, with a small business, you're, you're looking at uh, trying to meet this definition of a, a small business corporation so that you can take advantage of it. And as Annalie spoke earlier, if you had these shares held in a family trust, you can actually multiply it since each individual has their own uh, maximum amount that they can claim as a capital gains exemption. So it could potentially be a significant amount of gains that you can shelter as long as it's structured uh, appropriately. Uh, so what a QSBC is, essentially it's, it's a small business corporation that's either owned by an individual, their spouse, or a, a related partnership. Um, the, the key to it is that it needs to be owned for at least 24 months prior to the actual sale. And it has to be either owned by the individual, their spouse, or a, a partnership. Um, and the other test that you need to meet is, is making sure that in those 24 months, uh, more than half or at least half of the value of your assets are used at least half the time in an active business. So if you're, if you're holding a company with, uh, say, a portfolio of, of stocks and securities that are really just generating passive income, um, you would want to take steps to uh, remove those from the company uh, in an effort to make sure you, you meet the 50% the test. Uh, and as Annalie mentioned earlier, you could set up a holding company to hold shares and try and funnel that, that out uh, through the, the use of dividends. Um, really the key there to, to take away from this is just to think about whether you're in the process of, of selling or, or well ahead of that. So if you're thinking down the road in the next few years, um, I'm going to be selling my business, um, that, that's really the time to start to think about these things so that you're not stuck with this 24 month period putting you offside if you want to take advantage of that uh, exemption on the capital gain. 
So as, as uh, Annalie alluded to earlier, you can pay annual dividends up to uh, a holding company through a family trust perhaps, um, but basically removing anything that's not part of the active business operation. So you can have a certain amount of cash in the company that can be considered to be part of the active business. So you, you know, your working capital uh, of the business, that, that would be considered to be part of the active business assets. Uh, but like I said, if you had a, a portfolio of, of securities um, that, that are really just holding excess um, uh, cash that you had originally generated by the business, you want to make sure that you, you purify that company so that you're not um, holding those types of assets in it <coughs> during that 24-month period that you want to meet the test.